Hi, I'm Ann Risa Locke, the League's Program Director. Welcome to the final set of lectures by this year's Architectural League Prize winners. All of the lectures have been, or about to be, recorded and will be available for viewing on the League's website later in July. In the meantime, you can visit the League's website to view online installations designed by the winners, and in a few cases, you can visit physical installations on site in their home cities. Thanks go to the expertise and enthusiasm of League staff members Rafi Lehman, Alicia Botera, Sarah Wessler, and Ann Carlisle, who produced all of the digital material related to the lectures and installations. As many of you know, the Architectural League Prize for Young Architects and Designers is an annual juried competition organized by the Architectural League and its Young Architects and Designers Committee. This committee, whose rotating membership is comprised of recent League Prize winners, is open, um, is, it, sorry, this committee is um, comprised of recent League Prize winners, and it's the competition is open to architects and designers from across North America who are 10 years or less out of a bachelor's or master's program. On behalf of the League, I'd like to extend a huge thank you to this year's League Prize Committee, Luis Beltran de Rio Garcia, Che Carpenter, and Gabrielle Cuellar, for developing the competition theme grounding and inviting additional jurors, Christy Cornelius, Carla Gustava, Lola Shepard, and Mabel O. Wilson to join them to evaluate all of the competition submissions and then to meet as a group online to participate in an insightful and truly very lengthy session to select six winners from a strong field of entrance. Britt Cobb and Michael Beirut of Pentagram once again designed compelling competition graphics, and the downloadable installation poster, another way of getting the word out about the online and partially located on-site installations. All of this is made possible through the enthusiastic corporate sponsorship provided by Tischler & Son, Delta Millworks, and Judlow. Additionally, league programs are made possible in part by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council and the New York State Council of the Arts with the support of the Office of the Governor and the New York State Legislature. Support is also provided by the Next Generation Fund, which is an alumni fund of the League's Emerging Voices Program and League Prize Program, and the J. Clausen Mills Fund of the Architectural League, and of course, through the support of the League's member and friends. Although the spring 2022 program season is drawing to a close this week, have no fear, you can delve into League content throughout the summer program break through a vast archive of past league lectures and special projects, as well as by reading interviews and articles, all on archleague.org, as well as on urbanomnibus.net. Please sign up for our weekly newsletter so that you can be among the first to know about upcoming fall events. The announcements will begin to roll out by midsummer. League Program Committee member Tay Carpenter, founder and director of the New York City-based agency agency, and a critic at the Yale School of Architecture, will now introduce tonight's speakers. And after their presentation, she'll join them in a conversation and forward questions from the audience, which you can pose please in the Q&A section. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening. I'm Tay Carpenter and I'm thrilled to be here tonight to introduce the lectures of the 2022 League Prize winners, Farzan Lotby Jam of Farzan Farzan and Javi Aguirre of Stocky Studio two colleagues and friends that I have great respect and admiration for. At the end of the two lectures, we'll have a discussion and then open the floor up to a Q&A from the audience. The theme of this year's League Prize is grounding, a provocation that asked young architects how they contend with their context, both physically and as a current moment. The term may suggest locality, but grounding is inevitably tied to contemporary environments that are embedded in global systems which complicate architecture's relationship with place. Grounding thus means on one hand, making vital connections to what's already there, materially, socially, and otherwise, and on the other, contending with placeless pervasive processes. Navigating the remote and embodied, the non-local and local, architecture requires new methods of retooling, reappropriation, and transformation to find its grounding. And their winning portfolios, Farzan Farzan and Stocky Studio are two practices that took the theme head on, tackling unruly positions in architecture related to technological control and material economies respectively. Sensitive to their contemporary context with a precise subversive vibe and sometimes with a wink. The two practices are carving out different discursive spaces in the discipline, each producing a highly engaged body of work, less about legible objects, than about creating generous platforms for architectural production and for practice. 
Farzan Farzan is an Ithaca-based collaborative multidisciplinary design studio led by Farzan Lotkajam. Farzan's work exists at the intersection of technology, media, and fabrication, and utilizes a variety of research-based methods to critique and reveal the shifting and complex relationship between architecture and computation. Whilst technological narratives of optimization, efficiency, data management, and smooth rational urban flow are ubiquitous, Farzan's work unravels this technological positivism and establishes new sites for representation and inquiry for architecture. Those sites have a sweeping range, which I'm sure we'll see tonight, from the control systems of securitizations in a smart city like Rio de Janeiro to embedded, automa to embedded automation in domestic spaces like Farzan's living room in Ithaca. The work probes at questions of expertise and offers new tools and instruments to evaluate embedded structures of power. At the same time, Farzan Farzan trades not in novel forms, but rather in the invention of a practice model rooted in collaboration and a kind of sharing of his practice and his methods. The work is incisive, exquisitely rendered, and funny. Farzan has received grants from the Graham Foundation, M Plus Design Trust, and The Shed, and Farzan Farzan's work has been exhibited at Storefront for Art and Architecture, the Venice Architecture Biennial, the Seoul Architecture Biennial, and the Sharjah Architecture Triennial, amongst a number of other international venues. He's an assistant professor of architecture at Cornell University AAP, where he directs the real-time urbanism lab. Stocke Studio is an architectural design practice founded by Javi Lida Aguirre that is currently based in Detroit and Cambridge. Stocke Studio extracts from and interrogates global material economies and supply chain chains through tactics of assemblage, recirculation, and kit logics. Within a world of overflowing accumulation of physical materials and stuff and an oversaturation of media images, Javi prospects for both physical and digital assets from what already exists producing an architecture that, as they described in their portfolio, is an assembly of social and material parts. But it's also at once a punctus assembly that toys with material reality, using return policies at big box stores to recirculate their materials and media overlays as digital props. Javi's work expands the possibilities of sustainability discourse with a different subversive aesthetic and vocabulary. Recirculation and reuse over disposal, more parts than holes. Multiplicity over singularity, temporality over permanence. Its architecture is a radical form of inclusive infrastructure, allowing for events and social instances to occur across varying timescales and circumstances. Javi's work has been commissioned by Mocha Geffen, Super Blue Museum Miami, Design Corps Detroit, Storefront for Art and Architecture, Materials and Applications, California State Parks, and the Saloni in Milan, amongst many other international venues. They're currently a 2021 to 2022 Mellon researcher at the Canadian Centre for Architecture for the collaborative project, The Digital Now, Architecture and Intersectionality, and the organizer of the 2021 symposium, Post Commodities, Architecture After Stuff. Javi is an assistant professor at the MIT School of Architecture and Planning, where they're founder and director of the Mixed Matters XR Lab. Tonight, I'd like to congratulate and welcome Farzan, Farzan and Javi, I'm looking forward to hearing both of your talks and discussing the works further. Uh, you'll be able to submit questions into the Zoom uh, chat panel after the lectures, and I will hand the Zoom screen over to Farzan. Hello, everybody. Let me share my screen. OK. Um, let me know if something's not working in the chat, Tay, because I can't see everyone. Um, Hi, everyone. My name is Fazin Lotvijam. As Tay mentioned, I'm director of multidisciplinary design studio Fazin Fazin and a professor at Cornell. Uh, I want to thank you all for coming tonight. I want to thank the Lee for being such an important advocate of architecture. Um, and I want to give thanks to my collaborators and mentors whose work I'm going to show today and, and to my project team on the exhibition we produced for this and to Javi and Tay, whose practices and personalities I have long admired. Um, I also want to give thanks to my family whose story I'm telling in my exhibition. Uh, so like many in the audience today, I work in multiple modes and media, and this consists of researching with data sets, 
designing with algorithms, fabricating with robots, engineering interactive spatial media systems, uh, seen here, building diverse audiences across digital platforms, producing films that subvert the codes of social media, creating exhibitions that push the limits of discursive and immersive aesthetic forms, and making models of smart cities and their control syntax. And so my practice destabilizes the techno-utopian grounds that dominate innovation discourses in architecture and society. Um, and I examine how new media network infrastructures and the techno sciences influence the politics of architecture in the city. I've developed a method of working that uses design as a means of critical research and spatial practice. For instance, much of my recent work stems from an investigation to modernism, modernism's response to new technology and computation. And I apply this research to the most contemporary of design practices working in virtual reality, advanced fabrication, and new spatial media in an interdisciplinary form of what I term applied technology studies. I work in this way to understand and redesign the relationship between computation and the multiple scales, mediums, and spatial logics of late capitalism. To understand how computational media determines our situation, how it shapes the codes of our social interactions, powers the data-driven decision-making of the buildings we inhabit, optimizes the unequal distribution of goods and resources in our cities, and automates the production of human subjectivities. Algorithms, archives, cities, and subjects. This is the arrangement of concepts, sets, sites, and terms through which my practice operates, showing how all four co-produce each other and defining the spaces and architectures of each. Um, I had a very conventional pathway during my first decade in architecture before my graduate studies, working for design practices in Australia and Europe, shown here on large public projects, where I investigated how new digital processes could impact the logistics, design, and construction of architecture. During the next decade, my path led me to question our inherited disciplinary conventions and the techno-utopian solutioneering at the heart of the computational and innovation project in architecture. And so my intervention into these discourses and practices is to build connections between history and theory through design, to use computation to understand the processes and power structures that limit, condition, and govern what types of architectures and forms of human behavior are permissible, who benefits and loses from existing arrangements, and how the relationship between the computer, its military origins and commercial forms of capitalization have come to bear on the imagining design and management of cities. Um, and so today I will show you how my practice has evolved from, as you know, Tay also mentioned, exuberant form making to what I think of as an exuberant form of practice through a series of important collaborations with other independent designers and scholars to make these seemingly abstract technological transformations visible, material and manipulatable to design. Um, and so today I'm going to do this by first mapping out the evolution of my research inquiry through key collaborations and projects um, shown here through this timeline with the names of the collaborators, some of whom are in the audience today. Hello. Um, I will then present four projects that offer different interventions through design into techno solutionary discourses where I'm gonna talk about a counter model project, a subject as method and method as subject project, um, a project that renders visible certain logics and a project, my recent project for the league exhibition that tries to amplify overlooked and underexamined uh, histories. And so to talk about the evolution of my practice quickly and to just give you a little overview, um, this is a project called Your Cruise from 2014, um, a collaboration with Leah Dennis. And so from Leah, I learned to be sensitive to the codes and conventions of digital platforms and the importance of visual design. And I'm gonna just speak about you know, maybe like there's something I learned from each of my collaborators in the last 10 years and how that extended, deepened, and, you know, in many cases destabilized my own project and enriched it in certain ways. Um, a series of projects with uh, Mitch McEwen um, over the last decade uh, really kind of led me to learn that curatorial design methods can be much more direct, fast, and impactful than some of the ways I was working, and that building information modeling desperately needs Black imagination. Um, uh, a collaboration with Ava uh, Frank um, 
who's a curator and director of Storefront. Over a decade, um, Ava Frank supported, you know, first my hair before my project, but also took the biggest risk um, and gave me my first commission shown here and, and continues to create the institutional spaces that practices like mine need to operate in. Um, a collaboration with Glenn Cummings, Joffa Cobb, Caitlin Blanchman, Liam Meisland, Cher, um, shown here. And, and in this project from my collaborators, I learned to closely read the terms of service agreements and that rewriting one is both a political act and a design problem. Uh, a kind of a really long, almost decade long collaboration with Mark Wasuda. Uh, and from Mark, I've just learned way too much to list here. But you know, Mark's taught me to be always sensitive to uh, systemic logics, to always locate abstraction in material objects and practices, and to not just explain, but to also entertain and vice versa. Um, a collaboration with Caitlin Blanche who was shown here. And from Caitlin, I really learned the importance of bringing science and technology studies in dialogue with settler colonial studies. Um, and this collaboration with Felicity D. Scott and also Mark Wasuda. And you know, to speak to uh, Felicity, Felicity's scholarship has really opened up, I think, a disciplinary space for my practice to follow. She actually laid the ground for my inquiry. Um, and a series of collaborations with Adrian Lahoud um, showed me the importance of reciprocity, vulnerability, and the urgency of creating spaces for others to operate in. Um, so now I'm just going to take you um, through those four interventions um, very quickly and finish with my league exhibition. Uh, so the first project is share. Uh, here's us, the collaborators. Uh, and, and for this project, uh, we were looking at the sharing economy uh, for the Oslo architecture tree knowledge. And so we know that digital technologies of the so-called sharing economy have been transforming our cities for the last years. And they've also been transforming our understanding of domestic space and housing. Um, and so share a collaborative project with Caitlin, Glenn, Joffrey, and Leah for the 2016 Oslo architecture tree knowledge developed a public project for the city of Copenhagen in response to digital sharing economy platforms like Airbnb. Uh, the project is a, uh, is a smartphone app shown here. And quite simply, it lets you share anything. And it's a sort of a counter model, I think about it in that way, because we're pretty much giving you the exact same technical capabilities that Airbnb have, but we change the sort of um, the, the, uh, the terms of exchange and we give more agency to users rather than to Airbnb. So in this sense, it's a counter economic model for how to share spaces that goes against the platform capitalism in circulation now. Uh, modern management uh, uh, shown here um, is an exhibition that analyzes architectural historical processes and it was exhibited at the Shed in New York. Um, I collaborated with architectural historian Caitlin Planfield um, and we designed and, and it's a the project is both a research project and a book project and it, it, it asks how the value of a building is produced through instruments of expertise, management ideologies and historical narrat um, narratives and so through an unorthodox survey practice an x-ray uh, we use the kind of imaging techniques of conservation and the documentary production of heritage preservation um, and archive to show how scientific methods attempt to produce stable notions of history and value. Um, and so the project engages two buildings, um, the Le Corbusier design Weisenhof Sidlong in Stuttgart, um, and also the Le Corbusier involved United Nations headquarters in New York City. Um, and, and so this is the book that we worked with on Columbia University um, Art Press. And you know, what I really want to emphasize here is how we thought about how representation and imaging tools could allow us to see a building and its history and its reconstructions differently. In a sense, we were really interested in um, X-raying the details in the UN shown here um, after its capital master plan renovation that you know took a decade to do, where um, the historic image of the building was preserved while new technology was inserted into its cavities. And so the X-ray allowed us to see moments where the performance of the building was updated under new types of global um, aesthetic norms, but the historic image was, uh, was maintained. And so here the X-ray for us was a critical tool of image production and a mean to understand institutional processes. And the X-ray also revealed the risk and securitization at the physical and digital level of um, the project. Uh, the next project, Control Syntax, is something that I've been working on for, I guess, close to a decade now with Mark Wasuda. 
Uh, here is Mark and I uh, in Songdo, uh, clearly entering the uh, eco zone. And um, so this project analyzes the rhetoric of the smart city movement and its historic foundations in modernism and computation to understand the agency of architecture within an algorithmic urbanism. Uh, much ambiguity and criticism surrounds this hazily defined metropolis. Is the smart city an opportunistic label easily applied to any urban development? Is it a coherent global movement or a clever repackaging of essential utilities by technology companies? If the modernist city of hard infrastructure and machine logics gave way to one of networks and communication, the smart city is a shift to a kind of urban form, not just connected by neural networks, but determined by them. And while the smart city may be the most powerful force shaping the future of 21st century cities, what exactly this means is largely unknown. Um, and so the, the project is actually two exhibitions, uh, one that looked at uh, the implementation of IBM smart city technologies in Rio de Janeiro, and the other one looked at Cisco technologies um, implemented in uh, Songdo in South Korea. But for the purpose of time, I'm just going to show the Rio project. Uh, which is called Control Center Exterior, and it was shown at Storefront and Petno Institute. So Control Syntax Rio models a traffic route through Rio de Janeiro from Copacabana Beach uh, to Maracanã Stadium. Um, and I think, you know, importantly, the project looks at um, this space, the center for operations that was built um, in Rio in the lead up to the Olympic Games and a, a sort of a new cybernetic management space for the smart city operations. Um, and so the exhibition models a route from uh, Copacabana Stadium in the sort of bottom of this image to Maracanã Stadium, um, beach volleyball and soccer competition sites for the 2016 Summer Olympic Games. Uh, CORE was built in 2010, and um, so CORE is the kind of common name that everyone uses to refer to the center of operations, and it was built in reaction to a landslide. Uh, CORE was planned to anticipate and respond to future disasters and infrastructure failures. Importantly, um, it was intended to demonstrate Rio's commitment to improve urban administration and traffic management. CORE was heralded as an urban feedback system and a control center that would combine disaster response, urban sensor monitoring, and a form of intelligent traffic administration that would speed circulation during the crush of the summer Olympics and after. Uh, the technical and conceptual armature for CORE originated in I IBM Smarter Cities Initiative. CORE's primary tasks are to monitor, assess, and represent the metabolism of the city and to respond to actual or potential interruptions that drain, slow, or block it. Through the logic of the IBM code around which it is built, CORE measures abnormality according to four escalating scales of intensity, incident, event, emergency, and crisis. How this scale is registered and represented and how it determines response form the foundations of Rio's control syntax. Overlaid on the traffic route, control syntax Rio also traces a decision path through cause decision matrix. The model aligns the material traffic infrastructures of the city with the immaterial syntax of cause urban management code. Um, at first glance, cause control syntax of these banal and managerial, yet it is also charged with potential crisis. For example, if protests arrives, then traffic will have to be redirected to avoid paralysis. If buildings explode, routes will need to be cleared to usher response teams. Uh, here we go. Explosions, fires, protests, landslides, rallies and sudden tropical storms combined with faulty traffic lights, accidents, spilled trucks, burning buses and quotidian congestions as elements of the core control syntax. Uh, the control room shown here and song those is the active demonstration of urban sensing, information extraction, feedback and management, a theater of control. And so the reformation of urban vision um, is historical evolution from conferences like this um, and the decision trees and algorithms that coordinate smart city operations and the distribution, location and saturation of the city with sensors and cameras together provide the physical, spatial, and informational and political armature of what we are calling smart city control syntax. 
oh, I should have been on this one when I said that. Uh, and so, you know, if that kind of, if here the idea is to kind of take these sort of abstract algorithmic technological discourses and to sort of, you know, I kind of said to render visible their histories and their logics and to identify the set of relations that flow through material systems. And this is a kind of a, you know, a decade long project now. Um, in my last project, I want to show you how these different strategies, the counter model, the, um, the sort of uh, method as, as, as um, subject and subject as method and this rendering visual kind of come together. And also um, I kind of add one new way of working where I'm thinking about uh, uh, sort of amplifying under-examined and uh, overlooked histories. And so this is my league prize um, exhibition. Maybe you've seen it, but I'm just going to take you through it. And it's called My Domestic Routines. And so My Domestic Routines uh, comprises a film and a physical idea. Um, and the installation displays a catalog of readily available smart products sourced from IKEA, Amazon, Google, and Wise. And so I'm really looking at how smart technologies have entered the domestic interior. Um, and so the exit, the installation um, is, a, is a recursive routine um, that connects the, these proprietary um, smart technologies together and cast them in a never ending performance of detection and response. Um, the film, which I'll show in a second, and this kind of uh, takes you through the exhibition installation. Um, the film presents a composite image of uh, yours truly. Um, and, and my home as rendered through the attentive vision of the smart home industry. It reveals how regimes of monitoring have produced a neurotic domestic subject, simultaneously obsessed with seeking ever more representations um, of my domestic life while securitizing myself against the fears lurking in the American suburban imaginary. Our domestic routines may seem banal, even scripted and contrived. This exhibition captures a feedback loop between domestic desire, data collection, and the insidious possibilities of convenience. Um, so I'm just gonna stop sharing my screen for a second and share my video. And then um, we'll just spend a couple of minutes having a look at the video. One second. Um, let's just pause it right there. And so just to conclude, uh, I hope today I have made a case for how design reveals and can intervene within the way new media, network infrastructures and technological grounds influence the politics of architecture in the city. And I also hope that I've shown that this creates exciting new opportunities for critical, collaborative, engaged, and experimental design practice. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, 
My name is Xavi Aguirre. Um, thanks for coming today. Um, I want to thank the Arc League. Um, this recognition um, is this recognition just kind of lands in a very special and, and intense time. So I want to I want to thank them and I want to thank my my family, both um, given and chosen. You know who you are. Um, Stoka Studio, uh, my practice. Um, is an architectural production studio based in Detroit and Boston. In general, our research links the materiality of the built environment to the more immaterial, sometimes aesthetic, sometimes political factors that affect its making and circulation. It does this at multiple scales, from products to scenographies to buildings and supply chains. As a practice, Stock attempts to intervene somewhere in the reverse of the production diagram, starting from what we have made, the muchness we have produced, to create sort of other or new loops. We look for the material intelligence embedded in everyday objects and situations, and use these to develop other tools, material systems, social assemblies, and mixed medium environments. Designing with the full life cycle of an architectural project in mind, considering not just the project's beginning, but its end as well. I'm going to begin by presenting the Arc League project, um, which brings together a few kind of key principles to my practice, namely um, the attempt to turn built access into resource, designing disassemblable architecture or kits, and the use of image overlays um, towards the kind of material reuse project. And from there, I'll present sort of past stock projects uh, from which these principles originated. Some parts useful props. Um, this project is nothing new, literally. Conceptually, it combines a number of prior projects. Physically, all the parts, uh, both physical and virtual, were already existing. Literally nothing new. All the parts of the kit are and, and of the scenes created from it um, are gathered from earlier projects, as I said, or were things in my garage or borrowed from a construction site close by. Others came from a uh, recycle here, a center down the street um, uh, from this site in Detroit, while uh, sound and 3D visual assets were recorded or scanned sort of just a walk away. These parts are then put together to create a, a mixed media XR kit that combines structural elements with props and can be assembled to create a temporary mobile and multi-programmable architectural setup that facilitates multiple events and situations. All ran from a solar powered battery. This kind of mixed media assemblage kit has its origin story in the years prior to architecture where I was designing sort of scrappy cultural productions and sets for um, artists and comedians where I witnessed a kind of material recirculation politic that utilized both objects and aesthetics rather tactically, where things were designed with their disassembly and sort of future lending in mind, where stages and makeshift rigs were combined with replaceable visual assets and borrowed equipment to create utilitarian yet visually flexible setups for performances um, uh, or other productions um, or different kind of programming. This kit of parts rests on the reliability of a hyper utilitarian sort of industrial shelving system that I ha hacked to um, create a sort of easy, nimble, easy and nimble architectures from it. A kind of generic rig onto which specificity is added by way of the objects and materials that are incorporated um, onto it, both for their utility, but also for their prop like visual qualities, adding both use and character to the rig. Something chunky to sit on something soft to lay on, some sticks to hold things up, some panels for privacy, something tubey for liquids, something buckety to carry things. Each of these useful props performs a fundamental practical task in the physical scene, but also performs outwardly towards the making of the image, the scenography of its program and the virtual scene. Many of the parts gathered were painted in chroma colors um, introducing the use of the digital image overlay to the scene, infusing the components with that duality between their utility in the physical scene and their use towards the kind of virtual set. The use of the chroma paint allows for a kind of decoupling of the visual uh, from the physical complexity. As the physical parts, the substrate material can remain generic, unaltered, and reusable, 
while the visual specificities, personalizations, and complexities only come from the digital overlay. Ultimately, decoupling the object from its outermost layer, its image, making the parts of this kit visually customizable and momentarily branded, yet eternally flexible and permanently useful. This allows image and moving image to participate positively in the circular material economy by giving us a tool for aesthetic interpretability that does not require the making or purchasing of additional material stuff, like a digital sticker or a wallpaper that helps us re-image re the existing by changing the outermost layer and nothing else. This is in contrast to kind of formalist projects where the complexity of form, color, and material, um, material finish, et cetera, are kind of cooked into, um, into the material, into the geometry, um, making a project singularly authored and static or kind of one-off. Ultimately, digital overlays give the kit aesthetic and programmatic allowances as it can uh, visually transform itself, serve different users, and accept the aesthetic and programmatic input of whoever is looking to change its vibe, its use or its context. The kit thus becomes a project now, but also a platform for future other and others projects. Stock's iteration, as you are seeing it here, replicates a scene reminiscent to a kind of camping, um, um, camping set, camping, camping, camping ground, maybe. Um, because after a while of um, being inside, I just kind of wanted the project to be outside um, and use it as an excuse to kind of interact with people uh, near me. But of course, the XR kit uh, would produce a very different situation in somebody else's hands. Um, as a physical material real system, real system, the project packs up into a single mobile yet disassemblable structure that moves around uh, to sites nearby to provide a kind of infrastructural support for one to be able to set up a uh, shop in opportunistic sites like this one in a construction site nearby. Um, so far it's been used as a place to watch TV with friends um, under the trees, to eat pizza at a construction site, which is what you're seeing, um, and take a breezy nap in a yard. Soon as part of a longer, longer term collaboration, it will be used as a plant and produce kiosk for a farm stand um, uh, nearby or a kind of farm nearby. So the Arc League project, um, as I said, combines a number of the kind of important principles um, for stock, uh, starting with uh, the attempt to turn material access into resource. Um, arguing on behalf of the architectural project that does not start from the concept of newness, nor from a concept of originality, but rather from existing objects, building, a, building uh, existing objects, buildings and situations all around us, and attempts to either instill new value onto them or glean the intelligence embedded in them to create something um, other. This makes the work of stock often based on the observational uh, or the intuitive more than the kind of academic. This is best represented through a project called Stock, um, the project through which I sort of introduced myself to architecture seven years ago now, and some of you may already be familiar with, but it seemed appropriate um, to revisit in this moment. Uh, Stock was an Instagram account uh, back when Instagram was um, perhaps a, a, a sort of in the early stages of being annoying, uh, not as, as sort of full blown as perhaps it is now. Uh, it was a way to throw oneself into the spotlight without the need of disciplinary sponsorship or anointment, um, an open window into a profession that clearly had an inside and an outside. Stock created a catalog of images by collaging off the shelf products to create speculations that suggested alternative uses for common architectural products. Stock deployed many of the conventional, many of the conventional commercial gimmicks like fetishizing objects through portraiture, uh, using studio lighting and calculated backdrops while decoupling the output from any commercial value. No more or less cinder blocks were sold because of stock in any given month. As an act of sort of radical access to resources, um, otherwise not available to me for this project, I created over 600 images by continuously purchasing, photographing, and returning construction materials on a $200 credit. In effect, uh, taking advantage of big box store um, flexible return policies and utilizing the fine print of the commercial contract to create a project without funding or patronage. Stock was able to produce an identifiable body of work 
while sidestepping many of the usual flaws of the temporary architectural project, namely waste, lack of sufficient funding, storage fees, and access, while admittedly exchanging those for my own labor. It, cre I cre it created a model of practice for me, um, a way of working that engages not only the spatial products of architecture, but the socio-material economies within which they exist. Uh, a kind of uh, practice that continued with um, a chair has a concrete use, uh, a project um, with artist Gore Transmo commissioned by Berlin Art Week, where we took advantage of the lag time in the redevelopment of a former postal warehouse into condominiums to insert a multi-programmed cultural hub that remained in use and open to the public for a year and a half. For its design, we reimagined common domestic scenes and furnishings using only readily, readily available off-the-shelf construction materials, most of which we maintained in whole sheets, uncut, untreated, so they could be more easily reused in the future. The main structure and kind of cliche Berlin fashion was provided by recycled stacked shipping pallets, pallets which we used as something like structural stuffing. Uh, where we stacked the pallets, strapped them tightly together, and then sheathed them or otherwise covered them with um, the pallets with off-the-shelf materials to conceal them. Landscape pavers and foam blocks were used to create a pit that um, was uh, often used as kind of sleeping area. Um, a concrete-looking ramp became something of a gathering space. A backerboard plinth uh, became an eating area, etc. Using only commonly available materials in slightly less common ways, we built abstractions of domestic spaces. This allowed a flexibility of use uh, as each space did not outright declare its intended use. The installation hosted overnight stays with talks, screenings, movie shoots, political gatherings, and parties happening throughout the year and a half it remained in use. The project occupied an inter interstitial economy using the lag time in the development of this site as a kind of civic and cultural resource. Um, the second principle is the kind of uh, use of disassemblable, um, art, the creation of disassemblable architecture um, or the making of kits. Stock tends to not uh, make one-offs or finite projects. Instead, it tries to create material techniques, prot protocols, tactics, platforms, agreements, and prototypes for more feature-minded design modes. Uh, this is best represented by a project called Some Parts, a perpetually reusable architectural kit of parts that repurposes a light industry shelving system commonly used by companies like um, UBS in the understructures of uh, conveyor belts and warehouse material handling systems. The strut system is uh, strong enough to serve as a sort of uh, structural rig um, or light scaffolding and helps cover um, an often missing scale and in architecture sort of the one between the furniture and the building. Proposing assemblage instead of construction, the main design effort of some parts is in the development of removable surfaces um, and of non-invasive attachments, attachment mechanism or systems, such as custom brackets and custom ratchet straps that allow for the dismantling and future reconfiguration of the parts that make this kit able to serve future uses and users. The kit can be assembled and disassembled in perpetuity, can adapt to multiple scales of use from small benches to kiosks to greenhouses, and can absorb objects and accessories easily, furthering its versatility and allowing the kit to adapt to and serve entirely new scenarios and clients each time without producing additional waste. Relying on the shelving system for the structure, some, part, some parts uh, mimics the material strategies of concert rigs, rentable event tents, or information booths, where straps, um, panels, uh, tarps, and tension straps uh, complete otherwise generic structural frames to become more than a mere scaffolding, uh, something closer to a kind of recirculatable cultural product. Some parts includes a website where one can customize parts in order to adapt their kit to their needs and aesthetic wants, as well as a sort of video game where one can uh, could kind of immerse themselves in the component component options um, of of the kit. As seen here. The kit has had many lives. Um, uh, some uh, notable ones, which I will sort of show now. Um, start with um, uh, a budget gym, 
where the kid was assembled to to form a gym, uh, um, a gym, a meetup point, uh, a stretching station, and it served as a also as a kind of platform to showcase um, local artists with exercise exercise based sort of practices. Budget gym combines simple materials with uh, printed digital images, an approach that has been dubbed as internet tectonics. Um, the kit includes parts that form a total architectural microcosm, a structural steel system, foam paddings, furnishings, uh, water weights or ballasts, tape, tarp for sort of shade or privacy, ratchet straps as kind of structural ties, shims to negotiate the ground, inflatable dunnage bags as furniture and padding, sandbags as counterweights, and vacuum formed panels um, to provide, again, some, some sort of privacy or kind of moments of um, programmatic delineation. Later on in 2021, the kit became an immersive scenography for uh, the opera um, High Rise, a physical encounter uh, with sound by Ash Fury and Lilith at um, Mocha Geffen in Los Angeles, produced by the, um, the industry Los Angeles. A piece that originally premiered at Berheim Club in Berlin, the kit um, kept the kind of strappy, padded, interim methods of assembly and material palette that resonated with the kind of common uh, uh, sort of sexual happenings in the round, renowned queer club um, where, it, where it premiere, as I said. Uh, with soft foams, pads, and surfaces were performers um, and soft surfaces where performers would make sort of physical contact with the set all temporarily tied together, objects to objects and objects to performers, only existing together for the duration of the performance, but also had to become a kind of immersive installation that could outfit a 20,000 square foot warehouse. Um, so the kit was extended in both scope and architectural abilities um, as we created about six distinct rooms um, within the kind of immersive experience, uh, some of which included um, uh, plinths, um, lifeguard towers, um, and the, uh, in order to have the performers kind of raise above the audience, um, a stage, a rig for a video backdrop, um, a series of 30 foot um, industrial curtain hangings, um, and a kind of transparent billboard for, for the stage. Lastly, um, the sort of last principle is the idea of uh, using um, image overlays. Um, Counter to the kind of consumerist cycles that image more commonly participates in, this section argues that digital imaging can indeed participate positively in the circular material economy by using aesthetics and images sort of rather tactically. Um, this idea is best represented by the XR production and symposium um, called Post Commodities Architecture After Stuff, which happened at Tama College last, Tama College last year. Um, the content of the scholarship of the overall symposium as a whole uh, foregrounded alternatives to current models of commodity production um, and sort of committed commodity digestion at all scales of the current architectural production. The event itself was a complex multimedia production that combined a physical live, uh, live studio, um, a physical live studio environment for audiences to gather in, a live stream real-time broadcast, um, a live green screen uh, kind of key out workflow, and an interactive 3D augmented reality interface where audiences could step into an, uh, this interactive kind of digital post-commodity world in, in a kind of AR setup. Um, you can experience the, 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 the kind of AR world that you're seeing here if you um, download us an app called Sapbar and scan the code, which will be visible later on as well. Um, you can also go to like the Post Commodities After Stuff um, website to experience it more fully with sound, uh, with sound from um, Detroit Bureau, Bu the Detroit Bureau of of Sound. Um, thank you for your collaboration. The event used the live imaging capacities of digital tools as a way to create visual specificity and complexity only digitally, while sidestepping the material incrementalism that a project of comparable material complexity or signature would have required. So this work, uh, through this work, uh, Stock is beginning to look into the potential for real-time imaging, um, visual effects, and extended reality tools to facilitate material reuse, but beyond uh, kind of common reuse techniques. 
um, um, XR can offer us ways to see and resurface old stuff anew, giving us a kind of scenographic post-material tool to respond to a kind of object-saturated moment. On the physical side, the scene was sort of simple. Old objects and trash were gathered, um, which were then wrapped in green screen and dispersed throughout a kind of warehouse corner, used as a used as sitting, as screens, as scenographic elements. Um, and this was all combined with rented gear and a kind of disassemblable rig to create something like a spread out kind of life studio ex experience or a kind of landscape of like a studio experience. The 3D, envi the 3D environment um, projected onto them uh, set yet another scene, one of a 3D animation of a kind of archaeological site of kind of nowish times where one could slow stroll through um, uh, a kind of nothingness of discarded objects, encountering the kind of slightly um, uh, pathetic byproducts of our overly accelerated production cycles. The scenes were manifestations of the kind of tortured and confusing relationship uh, we have to stuff, as stuff both tends to sort of attract us and repel us. Um, and the ability to project rather than materially embed these intricacies by overlaying newness um, onto, onto the scene and onto the kind of um, uh, built site rather than making new things. Um, the immediacy of this kind of multiplicity and aesthetic pluralism without additional material excess is where uh, Stock sees a kind of um, uh, potential, a kind of uh, promise for life imaging um, to participate more positively, as I said, in the, in the uh, material circular economy. Um, by the next day, all the parts of the symposium were disassembled um, and made available to sort of next project. Um, beyond the projects here, um, there are um, there are some um, uh, principles of kind of material reuse, designing for disassembly, and incorporating um, XR technologies into the material economy that I believe that I believe um, wholeheartedly should trickle up to um, architecture at bigger scales. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Farza and, and Javi, for the lectures. Um, before we start the conversation, um, there's clapping coming in from the chat. Um, claps for you all. Um, I just want to remind the audience um, to please submit questions in um, the, the panel at the bottom left of your screen. It's in the control bar. Um, and at, towards the end, we'll pull questions and have, have a larger conversation with the audience. So. Um, thanks so much, everyone, for tuning in. Um, uh, thank you both so much. Um, I, I, 20 minutes is a, is a short time, and it's such a precise, condensed um, nugget of both of your works. Um, and even, I think, um, a development from the portfolios that we saw. I mean, I think the work has kind of come so far, even just in this sort of per period of time, and there's a kind of precision and clarity so much for what you're doing. Um, I guess what I want to do is start a little bit with talking about something that we had discussed the other day, which is just this notion of the platform. Um, and you're both of your swerves away from the authored object, the kind of single creator mode, um, and the, and and how you know both of your both of what you're doing is producing these platforms. So whether it's the platform for architectural productions, you know, Javi countering the newness, um, kind of like this participatory catalog of sorts, or Farzan as this platform for a collaborative practice, um, one in which I thought you spoke about really nicely, this kind of site of learning and destabilization um, in your lecture. And, you know, I, I wanted to open that up a little bit for both of you to talk about and, you know, perhaps, um, you each kind of brought up a little bit of the biographical in, in the lectures. So, you know, Farzan, kind of that slide where you talk about the first 10 years, you know, in architecture and then the path to the second decade, you know, where you, you began to interrogate the things that you had learned. And then Javi, I think this, you know, studying political science in undergrad and then kind of the use of Instagram and stock to kind of um, slide slide into a discussion and kind of introduce yourself using um, that forum. 
Um, so you actually said it yourself, kind of using stock to come from the outside inside through this kind of media platform. Um, and so I think, you know, I guess one, this idea, question of platforms, but then also both of you, you know, today we're kind of centering this discussion or this discourse that you're each bringing and like how, you know, where is it coming from for both of you? And like, what have you been reacting to um, to then come to the site of, of the platform and the kind of um, creation of a new form of practice and making in your work? <laughs> shall, shall, shall we get going? Let's loosen up. Let's loosen up, Farzan. Go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> button the top button so i was still i was still fuzzing with my video i was like pissed it didn't work <laughs> yeah it's like going back and i got so many moving image problems right now um <laughs> uh i can start um just to give you a second to catch your breath after that amazing lecture uh i think it's a good question and you know like in 20 minutes it seemed important for us both to put biographical history there, as you say, because it seemed like uh, framing for our uh, intellectual project. And maybe I know like when I started architecture, that wasn't really um, part of the deal, right? Uh, projects were argued through from kind of objective, neutral, universal positions, right? And uh, they were never sort of uh, in, you know, it was never like a first person position, all of these things. And so um, for me, I think, you know, for the first decade and the reason why I put that slide up there that you noticed, um, I was drinking from the Kool-Aid of Techno Utopia. Uh, like it was so captivating. Um, there's this, you know, quote from uh, uh, Rua Benjamin, who's a sociologist of technology or race. And it's, um, she kind of, you know, it's a, it's a way lots of people think about it, but her kind of phrasing sticks in my head and she talks about um, how technology captivates, right? And that it captivates our imagination, but it also literally captivates bodies, right? Through monitoring surveillance and all of these things. And I think like for me, I was kind of like my body and my imagination were captivated by um, uh, technological discourses around innovation and optimization and acceleration and these values that are kind of taught to us as kind of, you know, design values like flexibility and adaptability and all these kind of uh, criteria that are really coming out of a sort of a military history and out of the moment when the computer was invented as a Cold War kind of tool. Um, and so it just took me, you know, for me, it was kind of, I wanted more from uh, architecture and I wanted it to uh, go beyond, at, at least for me, kind of uh, being a luxury object for real estate investment. And I wanted, um, I wanted to continue, you know, I wanted to find a way for intense design uh, investment to uh, be sort of, somehow contributing to something other than uh, producing uh, marketing sort of iconic facades, which is I think where a lot of intellectual creative investment around computation goes in the field. Um, and so to kind of do that, um, I had to sort of, you know, I was a pretty efficient, I was a pretty good tool of capitalism. <laughs> like I could, I could make some very good commercial architecture um, and, and, and so I sort of had to kind of kill that side of myself um, and uh, started to sort of rebuild a form of practice by being attracted to other people's ways of working that allowed me to complicate this question of computation and uh, research and audience and a kind of an ethical framework. And so, um, you know, when we were talking about it yesterday, I think Javi, you kind of framed it really nicely like I feel like I started at the center of the discipline like in you know early 2000 parametric thinking had like just dominated the world and I had to slowly like find like my people <laughs> and go away and I think you were saying you sort of started uh from the outside of the discipline and you had to kind of you've now moved to the total center like look at you you're the winner of the Arc League prize 
and you're a professor. <laughs> I don't know, yeah. <laughs> right here in the center. Um, yeah, no, I mean, that's, but that, 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 that's it. Like you, you, you know, you're, you're, and you were in, you were trained in the center and like, it's amazing how sort of almost like, um, sweetly you have to kind of, uh, treat your collaborations because in a way they're like, they're, they're helping you kind of, um, like, like dissect, um, the kind of parts of that center that you're that you're kind of wanting to shed um and and it's and it's like it's something really hard to do right because like when you're when you're in the center you're like consumed by it you're like you know it's like you're like underwater um and it's um uh, it does seem like this this collaborations are um and but also your yeah yeah how how you kind of treat them and how you speak about them uh, it's very clear to me that you sort of like understand sort of what what they do for you and that it's like it's it's a it's a kind of uh, a beautiful task that others can kind of you know help like nudge out uh onto kind of like interesting ethical terrains and like of like that are you know much more like culturally interesting and stuff not that none of that would have come from you at all sort of like organically at at, at some point but it does seem you know like your buddies are like your accelerants. It's like pretty amazing to sort of hear you, um, hear that kind of reflected on how you talk about them actually. Yeah, it's like the fact that you, you know, like that was the the kind of bulk of your presentation I had like um, mad respect for actually. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, and for me, the task becomes a little bit like being the sort of like not feeling like a, not feeling like a kind of, um like an anchorless sort of like floating like bumblebee arriving in the discipline just kind of like I don't I don't know anything I don't know what like this like what jargon you're using I don't get like I don't get like you know like responsive facades having so much of your attention I I just like I'm like all right okay and so I had like no heroes coming in like I, and and but that also kind of meant no, um, no kind of like ground to stand on or like not no idea. So the task becomes like identifying what's, what's um, like, what, what matters or like what is good um, through like, at first, like sort of my own means, right? Sort of like, I, I just came in hard with like some strong intuitions. And so I, I like leaned on those for a long time. And then you start to, as you said, kind of like find your people. And then like, they start to kind of confirm like, okay, yeah, that, that part is good. So I'm going to keep that part of like, you know, that what, what I've heard architecture is about. So I, that one's, that one's a yes. And then that one's a no. And then, you know, whatever. Um, And I don't go at that hard against like responsive facades. It's just like, you know, whatever, just like a, a kind of an example. Um, but yeah, we're just like going in different directions right to the very sort of same moment, Farzan. That's super exciting. It seems like, yeah. No, that's so, it's such a generous read and I really appreciate that. Yeah, I think it's also, um, you know, that we're now in the sort of same space you know, you're, we're both kind of in the same venue of dialogue, right? And, you know, I think something that came up the other day that I just kind of kept thinking about was, um, you know, both of you, let's say, are, you know, operating within the media and technology and architecture space, right? And that you're both leading labs at, you know, great universities, you know, looking at XR, real-time urbanism, et cetera. And yet I think the um the ways in which you handle that and the kind of tactics techniques and representations that you deploy take kind of very different forms and shapes and so you know in terms of like how objects can take different forms how parts make holes whether there's a detail of connection or not levels of interactivity a finish etc um and at the same time i think what the tools are that you're using are quite varied too, you know, whether it's the sort of x-rays or the kind of XR AR um, that you are working on in the post-commodities symposium, Javi. 
and I guess I just wanted to get a to have you both sort of speak a little bit about um, you know how how you think about technique and representation in your work um, and how you think about the identification of that, the use of it. Is it still this kind of scrappy outsider, you know, application, or is it something, is it sort of a known toolkit or a set of methods that you kind of go to um, systematically? Javi, do you want to go first? I went first on the last one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, I was thinking, um, I was trying to figure out like how your stuff is like so tight person you know it's just impeccable I was like that like there must be something in the kind of like in 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 the setup right like in how you approach a project the fact that you know we talked about sort of um um you you kind of defended like one-offs a little bit more than 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 me so right if I describe my practice as a kind of daisy daisy chain of like the one thing is like in the next thing and then the next thing and all of a sudden it's just like you know there's days that I'm like I think I'm just doing the same project over and over and then I'm like oh yeah I am doing the same project over and over because like part of the thesis of my project is it can be anything right like it allows for anything so yeah of course like how am I not gonna keep doing like using the kit because I'm like it can do everything so it's just tempting to continue to use it um, but the way it seems like you've set up your practice that leads to the kind of uh, like sort of like just gorgeous kind of succinct um, identifiability of like each project is this kind of like, even though your practice is a kind of platform, like each, it's like a platform of, it's like a platform of one-offs, you no? Know? Like each collaboration is like a kind of thing and it has like a kind of maybe from here, it seems like a discernible beginning and end um, because of that collaborative nature, right? Like, because people tend to not, I don't it, it Anyway, maybe not, maybe with your collaboration with Mark seems to have be like decades long, but um, they seem to have like a, a beginning and an end. But something about that setup of like treating each project as a kind of um, project um, makes it just kind of really clean. Whereas mine just, you know, just sort of what do you, leads what all you over. What are you talking about? Uh, oh, not like in a, you're, you're so, no, no, putting my stuff down, just saying like it, as a. Uh, you're being so generous and I want to celebrate and be generous as well, but I want to, yeah. Yeah, I think like you have such a um, incredible argument for design that goes in the face of kind of um, maybe sort of dominant ideas around circular economy. And like, you know, it's like the two things that are basically shaping the future of cities is technology and environment, right? Like discourses around mm -hmm. technology and the environment, uh, like have, you know, they're kind of Siamese twins that kind of come in and out of each other and they lend uh, velocity uh, to each other's kind of, uh, to the, you know, to the litany of arguments and uh, products that kind of come out of that, right? So, um, and so I think like in the way that I'm trying to confront uh, technological discourse, I think you're trying to kind of um, take kind of like an engineering approach to sustainability and show that that's kind of, that that's rooted in body politics, right? And, and, and to kind of, but to also confront logistics, right? Like as this kind of like huge kind of um, uh, potential design tool in like responding to that. And, mm -hmm. and, to, and, to, and so I, I find that, you know, and I think like just, I was just like, as, as you were presenting, I was just like, oh my God, my crap sucks. Like, <laughs> your stuff is so good. And like, just like slide after slide, it's just like so, you know, wonderful to look at. Um, and so I guess there's just like, um, it's always exciting to see other people's projects and to enter into it. Um, I would say, yeah, like I've tried to nurture, like to your question, Tay, I've tried to nurture, you know, there's like different things that I'm working on with different people that, you know, uh, like I've been collaborating with a few people now for over five years and there's a kind of a line that we're following, right? And, and the things kind of come together and sometimes uh, some of the collaborations merge or not, but I do try to uh, maintain, you know, kind of have a sort of a practice around each project in some way. And, and so I think um, where representation and techniques come into that um, is that I'm very much interested in processes, you know, like institutional processes, 
algorithmic processes, urban processes, um, and my uh, architectural representation is also procedural in some way. It, it tries to take on um, relations and time. And I try to kind of show that. So everything I showed today is kind of showing that in some way. Um, so I don't know, like those are the types of, so I think I designed through process and it's like um, dialogue and computational process. I don't know. So th th I think that's what informs a lot of the way of working. And then I've just like learned, you know, I'm pretty schizophrenic at the start. And so some people just like, oh yeah, in order to be recognized by the academy, you need a body of work. In order for it to be a body of work, it needs to, you know, so I think like I've learned to conceptualize collaborations like that, but it's also good for me because it builds reflectivity. I don't know. So, so I think that's the way I think about representation. Yeah. Great. Thank you both. Um, I'm going to turn to some questions from the audience. Um, Aaron Vessler has a question um, and I'll just read it out loud. Um, thank you so much. I love all this work. I was hoping you both could talk a little bit about the role of participation in your work. I love the kit, for example. It's such a compelling thing to be working on. And I want to know more about who the kits are for, whether or not you see them as pedagogical in some way, how we come to know the ways they're arranged and rearranged, and how they organize people and social interactions. Yeah, I think that this, this kind of like mm, ties to a conversation that 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 conversation that Pars and we were just ha having the other day about sort of where um, the kind of near future of the of the projects or what or like what you and I Pars are going to do sort of like in in this kind of time where we find ourselves like in the center right where whereas the kind of I've used the kids so far as something that kind of um, have outward allowances right so other other folks could like interpret the kit um but as of right now it's mostly been used sort of in, as interpreted kind of like by me for many multiple projects and towards kind of many clients and absorbing many sort of um other folks like sort of aesthetic proclivities and 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 kind of spatial needs let's say so it's incorporated a lot of other people more sort of subliminally um but ones that were kind of already somehow in a part of the project um the next phase of 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 i don't know if of, of the kit but definitely of the kind of stock of stock as a practice is to figure out how to sort of um uh decenter these tools from like from from me from my my own interpretations of them or like my own um kind of me me creating the versions let's say and and kind of have them point um more outwards so how how and and Aaron I mean you're probably somebody that I should hit up for for major advice on how to open it up to kind of uh public input participation and 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 kind of future versions not not kind of going through me but yeah that's that's the goal create the kit let others play with it step to the side and just kind of be a little bit more of like the uh channel of kind of resources and and kind of access to those resources as opposed to have it be my own authorship sorry long answer but yeah Um, I'll just say a little, like just an anecdote. Uh, the the share project from 2015 that I showed, um, we, you know, it was a kind of a, it was it was a commission. It was like an eighteen thousand dollar commission for a, a triennial, and it was in the model of kind of like a, you know, usually you get like a pavilion, right? Like that that was the sort of it's, um, those curators were kind of pretty exciting, but you know, like like that's it's disciplinary sort of history it's like oh yeah you're gonna a public intervention is like a pavilion that's what you do with that sort of money and so we were like oh we're gonna like fund like a a year's worth of research travel to Copenhagen and run a bunch of workshops and this is really coming from Leah Meisterlin being like both an architect and a planner and really thinking through how to um, engage a public and and so we kind of spent like the first you know we blew half of our production budget just on like talking to people <laughs> and that seemed important 
And then, you know, in 2015, I like didn't know anything about apps and how to make them. And like smartphone apps were pretty novel. And we were like, all right, we're going to like make an app. And so we took the rest of our budget and like blew it all on making an app. And we thought, and then we opened the app and we're like, we, we did it public. We have the app. And then we just like, we're like, oh yeah, like no one's using it. <laughs> um, yeah. Like, and so that was like this like crucial lesson, which is like, um, you know, building a public is more important than building a product. And, and, and so actually like the, um, the, you know, the process, it's not just about um, engaging public in like conceptualizing what it is. You have to actually mm. engage them in using it and connect them with that. And, and so I don't know, like, so that's like haunted me for, you know, forever. And just like now I'm always trying to uh, bring my audience into the design process uh, and it do that in an iterative way. Um, and so, yeah, so building the audience is much harder than building the product. That's why this you know, marketing, but you know, I'm, so I'm saying like, we have to kind of find a way that's not marketing, right? So I think like, you know, so for me, exhibitions are kind of a way to, that that's a sort of a disciplinary space for like mm -hmm. using material spatial experiences to like uh, interject into discourses and to kind of be so sort of have a multiplying effect across the field. And so I don't know, that's why I kind of like do a lot of exhibitions. Mm -hmm. Kind of same. If I can add just like a quick little add on to that. Um, when I first started the kits, actually, the one of the videos that unfortunately didn't work, it's like it was the original website for the kit, which was a public public facing website in which somebody could go and essentially like um, see which parts of the kit like they could give me input um, to make in their fashion or like whatever through whatever inputs they wanted so you could like there was like a drop box you could like submit like a screenshot and I would kind of like print it on the phones or you know whatever um and yeah it also kind of like failed dramatically and like you know there was this kind of big debut like this like tons of time like spent on this website you know it was like cheeky and you know full of like screenshots and themes from like you know extracted from like birthday birthday party themes or whatever like just to be like it can be anything you know and like yeah no <laughs> it just kind of the kit retrieved back to my hands but maybe I should bring that back I'm going to ask Erin to help me out to how to make that successful collaboration maybe <sighs> Um, I'm going to go to Jerome Hayford's question. Um, he writes, great work and congrats. A couple broad questions for you both. And maybe I'll just start with the first question, Jerome. Um, you've displayed and we've seen literal sites and territories that intersect your respective practices, Rio and LA, for example. Uh, what's the role of literal site or territory in your current work? And are there literal or otherwise territories or sites that are preoccupying you now? I can give a really short response. Um, yeah, it's a great question. Uh, yeah, for me, with that site, there's no project. Um, and so um, all of my work, you know, and site as both intellectual, as uh, physical, as institutional. Um, and, and so uh, my process is to start with analysis of an existing site and, and to use that as a way to generate um, the terms of the research and the parameters of the design. Um, and, and so often um, interventions and responses to a site, whether that's technological discourses, whether that's um, smart city sensors, whether that's digital platform economies, um, these are kind of, you know, understanding those logics, the existing logic is the way I sort of work to respond. And, and so I just came back from a trip with Mark um, to Southeast Asia, where we, you know, in terms of new sites, where we're continuing the control syntax project, but we're looking at smart city developments vis-a-vis -vis developmental logics um, in uh, four cities in that region. So yeah, we've just been talking to a whole bunch of experts in smart cities. We've seen a lot of PowerPoint slides. <laughs> um, I think, um, so I, 
maybe maybe slightly different. I think site hasn't really played that big of a role in terms of the how I think about um, you know kind of material intelligences and sort of extracting those and develop them into like tricks and tools and it's um it's I think about those things as more like kind of infinitely applicable like they're not necessarily kind of like brand lit, branded with site and they're not from from anywhere in particular and they're not like sort of for anywhere in particular they're just sort of like for 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 all uses like like there's this kind of like infinite like utility that's like promised within within the kits and and tools at least um that makes the project maybe some somewhat sightless except for the arc league which was very intentionally a kind of uh me just wanting to spend um to do the project in detroit where i wanted to spend my summer um sort of where i live um but in, engaging a lot more before i have to kind of head out a little bit more um to spend a little bit more time in in boston unfortunately so it was like very very cited and the whole arc league project was essentially my excuse to like meet my neighbors and the like hang out at the construction site of like the like condos that are being built behind me and just like i don't know it was just like it the five like uh coordinates of the project are like each like a sort of a thing around me that I wanted to engage from like the recycling center to the produce guy to like the site yeah so that one somehow like changed everything to 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 a different approach yeah I think it's also interesting I think I remember part of the conversation in the jury I think Gabriel Quellar brought up this idea Javi your work is being kind of global vernacular mm. You know, that in fact, there's like the site is, you know, could you one think about the site as this kind of world of some sort of the ubiquity of these materials and objects and things. And so anyway, it was it was a kind of, I think, just an, a different kind of response to to what you're describing. Yeah, um, I'll just jump. I think we have time for this one last question um, from Anna Tang, um, and it's for uh, Stock A Studio. So the new system of architecture your studio created is very sustainable and has tremendous potential opposed to the traditional designing building architectural realm with its eye-catching aesthetics that involve queer culture regarding the world that is stuffed with stuff. However, trying to relate to conventional ways of architecturing, where would you envision the system's next step and applications in scale? And I think that's actually interesting. I was wondering a similar question when you talked about high rise with kind of coming up against certain scalar questions? Yeah, um, I don't think I'm gonna make, uh, um, I don't think mo like there's gonna be multifamily housing in my future, um, but there might be, there might be a, 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 a scale up. Um, I'm not sure exactly sort of how to, answer that in terms of like sort of traditional architecture I very much sort of define the practice as like um a, a, a technique or a thing kind of like times often or a thing times many or a thing times everywhere like that's that's what stock does it's like preoccupied with like developing like a, a cork spray that also has like gradient and weathers nicely to then apply to all buildings that might want it right so it's less about sort of yeah like a sort of the the, the dream is to scale up towards uh, a bigger building uh, but rather it's maybe to scale up towards um towards kind of developing things that are like truly like useful for people or like are truly like applicable or really like hit the like hit a market and make a, a, a a, a consequence you know like changes how we do like roof shingles forever or whatever like that like that that's the that's the scale up that I think I'm more interested in um I, there are a couple bigger projects I'm, I'm you know I'm working on a kind of sonic hub like a kind of um you know big kind of real project with 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 team and um for Dartmouth College and like that's you know that's that's a that's a huge scale up 
So not to say that I'm not saying that I'm saying uh, a, a total no to the build project, but I, my my heart is still on the kind of mass mass applicability as a kind of scale uh, interest. Yeah, it's interesting to that maybe it's not a size yeah. question of bigness, let's say, but maybe it's. Um, you know, one could also imagine the way you're just talking about site with the recycling center, the neighbor, that perhaps it could also be in the multiple. So the kind of instantiation of the kit at a multiple site level. And so you have 15 kits on your block. Yeah. You know, I mean, just yeah. just I mean, perhaps that's not a, a goal, but it could be something where there's a kind of testing yeah. of, of the kits at different sites and, and instances, et cetera, which would make like... a different version of scale. Yeah, which would make the project a kind of scale as like legibility. Like if 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 like if people mm. get the kit and people like get like its versatility and use and mm. they like uh like wanted it more and then more of them popped up, that's like that's good scale, you know? That's like mm -hmm. that's audience informed scale because the project all of a sudden became legible, but not size. Yeah. Anyway, sorry, yeah. Marzin. Um I think, yeah, you know, often you're meant to go from doing architectural exhibitions to doing buildings and in the exhibition you're meant to test um, or you're meant to demonstrate something so good that a client is going to swoop you up and give you your first commission. Um, and so, you know, the medium of architectural exhibition is the sole focus of my creative practice uh, with some other public media. Yeah. Um, I, I know we're at the, the end of our, our 8 o'clock p.m. lecture, but I just really want to say thank you so much. It's both seeing the work and then having this chance to have a more informal conversation together. It's just been a pleasure. And yeah, just congratulations again, both of you. Thank you, Tay. Same, Tay. Yeah, it's been and a I'd pleasure. I'd like to add my thanks to all of you. And, and actually, two words came to mind with each of you in talking about this. And whether it's questions of scale or whether it's instead questions of kind of amplification and intensifying. Um, and I think in, in both of your cases, there's this, you know, obviously strong inward look, but also a kind of lateral enrichment of form um, that is maybe more to the point. Um, it would fall into the kits category, I guess, in, in, in your case, um, in, in the, um, I don't even know where to begin and where it would work. Um, with yours, Farzan, but I think, again, just that kind of question about rep replicability within the work you're doing and how it expands that way versus scales up um, in the question of size. Anyway, thank you all. Um, this is you know, the end of this series for this year, but not the end of the material being produced for this series, because in fact, both Tabi and Farzan have taken part in interviews that are in the process of being edited and will be published on the League's website in the coming weeks. Um, and as I mentioned, these videos will be up along with a lot of other resource material about this year, and you can find things like Hayes installation last year, for instance, um, all on the site. So thank you for joining us, and um, we'll see you all again in the fall.